some of the, just the helpful piece to be in the context of, of the scripture here. You, you, you who have, are able to be here on a regular basis, you know that, that these are words of the prophet Isaiah spoken specifically here, the era of the time of the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. Ahaz is the current king. Uh, in the days in which Isaiah is prophesying here. He's speaking to this generation. And what we know about Ahaz from the aid of the other historians re that record for us in the books of the kings and the chronicles of the kings, that Ahaz of the southern kingdoms was a wicked, vile, ungodly king. E even in that, Isaiah attempts and pleads and presses into him to look to God. But he resists. He, he grows in his pride. He increases in his arrogance. And he, he even flowers himself out in pious, piety, self-piety, um, self-righteousness, that which is unholy and unhelpful at all and really takes glory away from God. And, and it's an attempt to fix it upon ourselves in our intellect or our own well-being. And obviously Isaiah chapter 8 in its entirety shows us what a foolish act that was of Ahaz to do. This is largely sitting upon the whole of the nation. So we, we can see that the effects of one individual doesn't just, doesn't just affect the individual. There are impacts upon households and nations even. And so... When we come to this in, in, this, in verses 16 uh, to the end of this chapter is really the, the, the therefore statement. It's the, you have reason, reason, reason. I see three primary things that Isaiah says to Ahaz and really to the nation as a whole uh, previously in these verses. And then in verses 16 and following, especially at verse 18 where the, the word the sentence begins from the New American Standard. The word behold is really a, a therefore type of a statement. So out of everything I've been saying, behold this or therefore this. So a type of conclusion. So just be reminded here that Isaiah speaks in the previous verses. Uh, he speaks of Assyria coming to the aid of King Ahaz. And why did Assyria come to the rescue of Judah because Ahaz, ungodly and, and, and selfish in his ways, makes an alliance with a pagan nation. Rather than heeding the cautions of Isaiah to turn to God, to Yahweh, Ahaz turns to the kingdom of Assyria. And so there is a word of indictment there to Ahaz, to the southern kingdom, that while they are at war and in a defensive posture against their kinsmen, the northern kingdom, that they've made an alliance with another pagan nation, Syria, and that they are these two, you remember Isaiah calls them burning coals. They're, 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 they're just smoke. They're really not that much to be worried about, Ahaz. But Ahaz is so burnt, bent up about these, the news and the rumors that they're going to come in and attempting to seize the city. So out of that, Ahaz makes an alliance with, uh, against the instructions of the prophet and against his God, he makes an alliance with another worldly kingdom, uh, Assyria. And so they, uh, by the providence of God, God does use the Assyrian kingdom to come and stop Israel and Syria in their alliance to work against the southern kingdom Judah. Assyria comes in and completely envelopes them and takes them on. And, and it's about a 65 year span of time. Uh, 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 Assyria comes in quickly and takes them. And then over the next 65 years is a systematic exodus of the northern kingdom uh, into slavery. And then there is a judgment that is given against that northern kingdom. That's, these are things that are in the previous verses. That, so we get to the conclusion of, uh, of Assyria coming to the rescue of the, of the southern kingdom. And then a judgment is given by God against the southern kingdom for making an alliance with Assyria. 
And then finally, uh, before we look at the therefore, the conclusion of these things, there is this judgment that God brings against any nation that uh, opposes God's people. And so just for some clarification, it is Assyria that is this massive monster that is chewing up landscape and nations along the way. It's when Assyria begins its attempt to eventually overtake the southern kingdom that they are actually overcome by Babylon. And Babylon just chomps away at everything Assyria took up and completely uh, consumes even beyond. So there is, out of these Persian types of nations, Assyria and Babylon, essentially modern-day um, Iraq, uh, it's always kind of interesting to pull out your modern day maps and lay these things over biblical times where there still is great turmoil in the regions of the world. Well, so it's out of those three things that Isaiah is addressing in the previous verses that he'll come to say, behold, or pay attention, or therefore, because of all of this, this is, this is the statement is here. So pick it up with me. Let's, let's look from verse to verse. It's beginning in verse 16 where he says to bind up the testimony and seal the law among the disciples. Now this would be a reference to in the, in the very start of this chapter. Remember what Isaiah does? He comes out and God instructs him to write on a tablet or to write on a scroll in plain letters these words. And remember what those words were? They, they said swift is the booty or quick is the prey. Uh, that turns out to be the name that God tells Isaiah to give to one of his sons. And so he, he, he names his son Mahar Shalah Hashbaz. Uh, in other words, swift is the booty, quick is the prey. That's the name of his, of his son. And he's told to write it, make this a testimony, make this a statement. And so uh, God is instructing Isaiah through the power of the Holy Spirit to conclude this matter, make, make this known out of what's happened previously. Let's seal it up. Let's bring conclusion here to this. And so it is in the following verses that Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. So consider what Isaiah is saying. He's just levied these charges against Ahaz and Judah, he's given a judgment, even though God's already brought his judgment upon the northern kingdom. Isaiah speaks about them in his, uh, in his prophetic words. But here now, Isaiah's position is to step back and to watch. He's said the words, he's spoken the words, he's declared what God has declared, and now his duty is now to hide, because God is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, Isaiah now, his duty, his task is to eagerly watch, to eagerly look, to wait for Jehovah. And then he gives us his conclusion. Therefore, behold, this is though Isaiah has gathered his household. And remember, all of his children bear evidence and these children that Isaiah there's three of them in total we don't know if the middle child is Isaiah's or not he just makes mention of this child named Emmanuel who he'll speak again about in chapter 9 but there there you can just see that Isaiah has put forth in front of everybody first of all here is my son whose name is a remnant shall return or a remnant shall remain and then here's this child who will be born to you. His name is Emmanuel, God with you. And of course, that's a prophetic word. And we see that best in the light of New Testament, where the Holy Spirit instructs the writer of Matthew to speak about this Emmanuel, this God is with us, Jesus Christ himself. And then there's this son of Isaiah, swift as the booty, quick as the prey. Uh, to speak about. So you have these signs and wonders, these, these miraculous things that God, these are announcements that God has made to the southern kingdom. A remnant will remain, which, which remember that could mean one of two things to Ahaz. That's either good news or bad news. It's good news because God will preserve his people. It's bad news because God is about to, to, 
to bring his judgment against you. And the good news out of that is he will keep a remnant of his people. So you have this child with you, and then you have Emmanuel. God is with you while this is happening. Don't fret. Don't worry. God is with you. And then you have this other son's name. Swift is the booty. Quick is the prey. This, this mighty Assyrian kingdom is on the march. And so they stand as indictments. Isaiah and these children that he's introduced to the nation. He says, I and the children, in verse 18, whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So let's just see a couple of phrases that are there. The Lord of hosts, if you've been here at all, at any time in our journey through the book of Isaiah, you recall, you'll remember, you'll see this phrase is one of Isaiah's favorite phrases in his descriptions of God. The Lord of hosts. Your translations may even say Lord of armies or Lord of heavenly armies. It's a, it's a very similar phrase that appears in the Gospels whenever the, the angel appears to the shepherds that night when they announce the birth of Emmanuel. And then suddenly, Matthew describes it, suddenly there is a heavenly host. And that's the same type of phrase that is used in Isaiah's favorite phrase of God, the Lord of hosts. There is no limit to his sovereignty. It is a massive Un, 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 unable to even number. And so these, these children bear as a witness to the whole of the nation, the divided kingdom, Israel and Judah. You remember before or through Solomon, it's a united kingdom and they're known as the nation of Israel or the children of God. Well, so he says it's a reference to the whole, even though they're no longer united, it references the, the entirety of, of, of Isaac's seed, of Jacob's seed, of Abraham's seed. And then to make reference specifically to the capital city of Jerusalem. And so again, here's an, here, here are some things that help you as you read the scripture. When you see Mount Zion, uh, that's a way, that's a, a reference to the city of Jerusalem. So make note of that when you read through the text. When you see any kind of a reference to the Mount of Zion, it is to the city of Jerusalem, and we can even make even closer, narrow down the, 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 the satellite scope, not just to the city of Jerusalem, but even to the place where the temple exists. And so he says these things. My, these, these children stand now as signs and wonders in the whole of the, 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 the kingdom of the Lord of hosts, who dwells, who encamps, who, who is at and on Mount Zion. So verse 19, when they say to you, we'll have to answer who the they are in just a moment, but when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, uh, should not the people consult their God? Should they consult the dead and behave or, or, or on behalf of the living? So these they, we, 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 we can see from the larger scope of really a couple of chapters that this would be, this could include a large numbers of people. It can include uh, certainly those who are counsel to leadership uh, in the secular realm, those who are giving counsel to Ahaz, which would, would might explain why Ahaz was not willing to listen to Jehovah and more readily willing to listen to the counsel of those who were really not at all captured by Jehovah. Uh, it, it could be really the sentiment of the whole of the nation that there, was, there has become such a, a spiritual atmosphere, not a godly, but spiritual, that they come speaking as though they are spiritual. We, we can, we, whoever the specificness of them are, we can certainly see that what this would say to us, well, we would look at it, that we too would be among a people who will come speaking spiritual types of languages. 
or speaking in spiritual tones that would once persuade us into their frame of thinking. Specifically here, he's speaking to uh, soothsayers or uh, fortune tellers or uh, those who are holding seances and dabbling with spiritual activity. So we, we can use the word spiritual language, but we would want to delineate the difference between godly and ungodly. This type is of the ungodly kind. They are consulting the horoscopes. They're consulting the fortune tellers. They're consulting those who are, they're, they're consulting the palm readers. They're consulting the, astrolog the astrologers, not in the scientific sense, but in the, in the sense of what do the stars tell us and the alignment of such. What does that mean? And you, you, you can pick this up from Scripture that this would be a practice of many kingdoms and from time to time, even kings of God's people, that they will go and consult these types of individuals. Saul himself consulted mediums, uh, speaking to the dead. And so my, my point today is not, is that real or not? No, you need to know it is, and you need to know you need to stay away from it. And you need to stay away from it at all levels. Whether, whether a game company puts it out and calls it just a silly little game, you ought to stay away from it. If you pick up the newspaper and you read the horoscope just for fun, I say, oh, why, why at all out of any kind of entertainment are you consulting that which is intentional to mislead and misguide people to hear what the spiritists are saying? Do not dabble in the silly behaviors of godless people or ungodly people. Both one in the same, perhaps. And this is what was happening, that there was a rise among those who were giving counsel to leadership which had a larger influence upon the whole of the people. They're saying, well, uh, you're not getting a good clear picture on this from Scripture. You know that church you go to, all they do is preach about God and Jesus. And you know, you can, you can come and, and consider something else. You, you, do, you should not and you must ex exercise extreme Caution in what you allow to give leading instruction into your life. Consult them. <clears throat> I think that it's even fair to say, because he'll go even further, not just in the consulting of the mediums and the spiritists, but he'll qualify them, even as in their whispering and their mutter. So whether it's the way they spoke, the, 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 with they soft and they spoke in such a sincere way in this manner? Or, or are they kind of essentially mumbling as though they're in a trance of some kind, as though to impress that obviously you must be under the influence of, of a spiritual, of, of such a spiritual kind. And they see it in the way they speak, the tone they speak, the, the language in which they even would pick it up. And I, would, I would say you must exercise as a, as, as a smart thinking, God-fearing individual. Know that many spiritists and many mediums are, are buying for your attention in all kinds of ways. Through entertainment, through satisfaction, through meditation, through, uh, through the emptying of your mind, all attempts in all ways to try to convince you that you need to rise to a new level of spirituality. Any movement of God that tells you to close your mind off and empty it and stop being a thinking person is a dangerous place. This is one of those things that makes Christianity quite different than every other religion in the world. Now, you'll get accused of being closed off because you accept and you believe the Bible. But the Bible tells you to engage your mind. So do so. Look at it with logic. Look at it with reason and give consideration to it. You will still have to believe what God has put before you, but nowhere in any place of Scripture can there, be a, can there be a valid, logical argument 
that in order to really know God, you need to empty your mind. <laughs> your mind needs to be part of the process. Don't lay it aside. Be careful of anything and anyone who is under the influence of mediums and spiritists. I think that means you ought to look closely into the music you listen to. I think that means you ought to look closely into the, into the programs you let entertain you. Not in the product that they're producing, but look at the people. Are they behaving in a manner that puts the glory upon God and not upon themselves? I would say do the same with your politicians. You look closely at what they say. You, you observe their lives. They'll, they'll get disgusted that they're in such, public, in such public places that their lives are a fishbowl. Oh no, they're politicians. They volunteered to do such a thing when they ran for office and, and the people elect them. Be careful. Observe. Watch. Be certain. Aware of what's influencing them and why they would want to influence in any kind of a way. And so they, they would say, or Isaiah, in, in their muttering, in their, in their, in their spiritualized language uh, of these things, casting doubt upon who God is and what God would want to lead them, Isaiah strongly says, should, rather than listening to the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should you not rather turn to God? Should you not rather turn to Jehovah and consult Him? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Do you recall in Luke whenever Jesus is speaking about this man Lazarus and the rich young ruler? And there's this discussion, there's this speaking about this rich young ruler, he dies and goes to hell. And he makes mention of this massive gap, this chasm, this impassable chasm between there and here, between there and paradise, there and heaven. And do you recall what this rich young, rich, rich, rich young ruler pleads to Lazarus, that poor beggar? He says, hey, hey will you go back and will you warn my brothers I'm dead. Will you tell them that I'm telling you to tell them to not go the way that I've gone? You remember how this unfolds and Jesus says, hey, they, they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets. Why would they listen to the dead? They have a testimony living in front of them right now. Christ the Lord Himself. They're going to believe a dead person over the living God? Consult Yahweh. Stop being so infatuated with the spiritually dead people who want to impress you with their spiritual activity. I say this as a warning to all of us. And I would say this especially to our young people. Be careful what you let influence you. You think, oh, it's just good entertainment. Oh, it's just good music. No, you are allowing that influence upon you. Be so careful. I carry that caution over into the supposed Christian community as well, by the way. There's a lot of stuff that's put out as family friendly that I would still say, I don't know that it's necessarily true. Um, most of it may be, but be careful. Be extremely careful. Careful. I say this perhaps one last thing on the matter. You know, throughout the ages, especially in the modern era, the popularity of Christian music, do you realize that there is as, as ungodly activity among those who present themselves as godly entertainers? I don't have a percentage to put in front of you, but I can tell you a large portion of them have wrecked homes just like their counterparts who, do, who make no claim to being Christians. 
Many of them, you go and you research them, you read their testimonies, and they'll talk about being on tour during their concert days, and they'll talk about being drunk and high on drugs. I say be careful. Be careful about everybody you let give influence to you. Why not consult God on what God would say to you? So I, I should press on. Isaiah's response to all of this, I love it, with an exclamation point even in the English here because it speaks of the emphasis that the original language gives to it. Isaiah says, to the law, to the testimony, to the instructions of God, dear people. Go to God. Stop this nonsense of consulting everybody else to the instructions of God. Do you love His commandments? If not, ask God to give you a love for His commandments. To the law, to the testimony. It bears evidence in front of you that God is who He says He is. If you do not speak according to the further in verse 20, if, you do, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Now that's a way of saying they have no light. Your translation may have just gone ahead and made the, the, the great clarity there that they speak like this in consulting the mediums and the spiritists and the, their whispering tones and their muttering ways. And they're consulting the dead to give to give instruction to the living, and they do so in this manner because they have no light. The light of God is not in them. And you're giving them privilege to speak to you. You're giving them permission to come and to give instruction as to how you should respond. Be extremely careful. Many people are speaking from their vantage point of darkness and, they are, and, and many people are assuming they are speaking from a platform of light. They will pass through, in verse 21, they will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished. Meaning they're, they have a mission, they're on their way, and while they're doing so, they're hungry. What are they hungry for? A listening ear. They're hard pressed. They've found new ways to get their message across. They're hard pressed. They, they, they know that if they don't do something now to advance their cause, that people will not give attention to it. And so they're famished. They're hungry. They're, they're, they're longing for darkness, not light. And they will turn out to be, in ver further in verse 21, they will turn out that when they are hungry, that they will be enraged and they will curse their king and their God they, as they face upward. So in this day of Isaiah, there is such a spiritual movement that has happened and, and a movement away from true worship of Yahweh. Remember what's happened in the temple? Already, Ahaz has sold off most all of the utensils and the gold of the temple. There's hardly any spiritual, real spiritual activity happening at the house of God. Why did Ahaz sell all this gold off and these utensils and things of the temple? Because he had an agreement with Assyria and he had to pay the price for it. And the nation paid the price for it as well. Families paid the price of this. And so they are... There is now in this day, in the pressing forward of the agenda, people now will turn and they will curse their king and their God as they face upward. So that's a, that's a phrase that's saying they're not stopping their religious activity. They're still engaged in religious activity. They're still looking like they are religious people. This is the, this is the same kind of, of tone or same kind of a presentation that you get from when Moses is up on the mountain and the people grow weary of waiting for Moses to return. So they turn to Aaron and they say, Aaron, here, here's all of our gold. Make for us a God who, who brought us out of Egypt. Give us a God. Give us a Jehovah. 
Give us a Yahweh. That's the very phrasing that they're using. It's the same way, it's the same thing Jeroboam did whenever the first divisions of the kingdom took place. And out of convenience, Jeroboam gives the people two different places to worship God rather than on Mount Zion. And in that, he builds two golden calves. And he names those calves Jehovah. So they're doing spiritual things. Really, their language hasn't changed at all. But their attention and their devotion is not to Jehovah at all. It is really to this hungry, famished, hard-pressing, spiritist, mediums, ungodly people who want and know that they must appear godly in order for this people to buy into it. So you see the... The great caution lands here for these people that we are certain as to what we've devoted ourselves to. And this is the unfolding of the text that Isaiah has said, now I sit back and I watch and observe with these three witnesses, these three children that bear witness of these things before you and to you. Now watch as God moves. And what is God doing? He's allowing the rise of the spiritual not godly, but spiritual people and their influence upon the bulk and the, and, and, and the mass of the population. And out of that, the people's activity looks really no different than previously. The only difference now is they are not at all worshiping Jehovah. They're now cursing Jehovah. But they're doing so in their religious practice. They have full-blown accepted a different God. And they've embraced another God. And so then in verse 22, they will look to the earth and behold. So before we see what they behold, notice what they've done. They've, gone, they've, they, they've become like those whom Paul warns of in Romans chapter 1. They, they now no longer worship the Creator, but now they worship the creation. Now they've put that which God has created as the Supreme, and they have rejected and reduced the Supreme, Almighty, Jehovah. So they have looked to the earth, they will look to the earth, and as they do, as they behold the earth, as they accept it as such as it is, here is their reward. It may not be at the very moment, but distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will then, they will be driven away into darkness. This is as though we're reading Romans chapter 1. If you've not read Romans chapter 1 in some time, you ought to do yourself a favor and go reread Romans chapter 1. This is exactly what they had done in their distress. In their darkness, rather than turn to light, they turn to more darkness. In that, they find gloom of anguish. And now they are in position now where now they are even driven by it. This is what Paul means. That God has turned them over to their reprobate minds. He has now removed His hand of grace upon them in His mercy-driven ways, and He now lets them completely indulge and drive toward that which they want. And where are they driven to? They're driven by their appetite for godlessness and ungodliness. They are driven into darkness. Well, let's at least pick up verse 1 of chapter 9 and then let's let's go to way of application of the text chapter 9 verse 1 so all of this as Isaiah is saying here 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 are here's the testimony many people are giving themselves into the the, the mediums and the spiritists the whisperers the mutterers they're, they're listening to the dead and Isaiah says no no for you to the law to the instruction quickly now to it but they refuse, they don't, and so they now are driven to darkness. But, that's a, that's a time when Scripture, when, when that start of a sentence is the news of good news. But they, 
But there will be no more gloom for who for for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he, meaning God, treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Now there stands news, good news of the gospel and it's widespread to all nations. It sits there and Isaiah, the evangelist, is announcing it. Where this is the move of God's people. They are rejecting Yahweh as their God. They are no longer consulting God for direction. They are now consulting the spiritist. The super spiritual among them. And they come across in such ways because when they speak, they speak with candles lit all around them. And I'm not opposed to candles, but know what's happening in these kinds of moments. They're trying to present a facade, a super spiritual facade that, that they are somehow more spiritual than those who use fluorescent lights to illuminate so you can read and study the Word of God. They want to cast a shadow on everything so you don't see light. It's so, it's so dangerous, church, that you not be taken away by darkness. So what, what should we do here? I, I, I take you right back to verse 20. And I say to you, to the law, you must go. To the instruction of God, you must be under her influence. I know, as you must grow weary of it sometimes. And Paul, you, you, you must think there's evil in all things outside of the church. I, I'll be quick to tell you, I think there's a lot of evil inside of the supposed church. We must exercise the same caution when we are organizing ourselves as a church lest we become like these people. But I say, when it says to the law, I, I know what our culture wants to do with this kind of thinking. They want to call you legalist because all you want to do is consult the Word of God. Uh, the, the titles are hurtful. I get it. It, it puts a prick inside of us. We don't want to be seen like that. We don't want to be talked about like that. I say, let them, let them say it. It's so easy for the preacher to proclaim it. And, and, and I could tell you testimonies of times whenever I so much didn't want to be known as that while wanting to walk in a manner before God. But indeed, we must prepare ourselves for the kind of attack that will come against any people who will devote themselves to be under submission to the authority of Yahweh, of Almighty God. Consult the Word of God. This is, why, this is why it's so important for you to be a regular reader of Scripture. Now, I don't know if you're of the, the practice of taking inventory of where you spend your time or how you spend your time or what you allow into your life with the time of your days. You know that you have limited days of waking hours. And, and you, you, you get that, you understand that. And so what do you do with it? How are, how are you going to let the waking moments in, influence the whole of your life? If you've not done an inventory recently, can I invite you? To examine your life under the lamp of Scripture. Who is your primary influencer? Who has your ear? Who has your attention? Oh, this is no day to pack up your bags and move to the hills. This is a day to open your Bible and ask God, how do I live godly in this day? Will you be that kind of one who will go to the instruction, to the testimony of God? Will you consult the oracles of God? Or will you be like these and others, even in our own day, who are consulting the foolish wizards of our day? The foolish spiritual, the foolish ench enchanters, Will you go to them? 
Will you let them be the reason you laugh? Will you let them be the reason your emotions cause you to cry? Will you let them be the ones to move you? Or are you going to be among those who will, as quickly as possible, get to the instruction, the oracles of heaven? So what does God require of a saint in a day like this? What does he require of us in a day like this? Again, I would say to the, to the instructions, God tells us what he requires of us. In short, Micah tells us in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. You could take those three things that Micah says and you could, you, you could unfold myriads of things that would speak to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. What do you do in a day like this when many, when most perhaps even, are consulting everybody but God? Well, your task is pretty straightforward. Do justly today. Love mercy today and walk humbly before your God. In all of your business dealings, in all of your conversations, in all of your recreation, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. What, what use do we make of the Bible in these kinds of things? First, you must realize that the Scripture, the Word of God, does reveal to us, first of all, and primarily, who God is. How can you know if you're obeying God if you don't even know Him? And how are you going to at all be, how is it even going to be possible for you to know Him when you do not allow His testimony to tell you who He is? You, you let so little time influence you about who God is. And this is one of the hardest things that comes to the task of reading Scripture. And I, I, if all you're doing is reading for the sake of literature or for the sake of checking a, uh, checking a, a box off on a list, then, then I would still say to you, that's better than not doing so. But don't read it like that. Read it in the way in which it is actually intended for you to read it. It is God telling you who He is. And it is God telling you who you are. It is God telling you what you need to do because of who you are. Sinner. An enemy of God. It's telling you what you must do to be reconciled to God. You must believe. You must repent of your of your pagan God. You must repent of your idolatry. Put all gods aside and worship and seek only God and Him alone. Trust that when the Bible speaks, that it speaks according to who God is. It speaks from that vantage point. When you read Scripture, when you make use of it, when, when Isaiah says to the instructions, to the testimony, go to that which has been unfolded for us. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that in times of old, the prophets spoke to us like this for this reason. Go to the counsel of the Word of God. Go to it and seek it. Let it speak to you accordingly in your life. Make this Scripture the standard. Now this Scripture is not a, some, it's not a book of magical incantations that, will, that you can speak a few and believe a few and it will somehow change the course of this day or that day. No, if you're treating this Bible like that, then you're no different than the spiritist. You're no different than the mediums. You're no different than the spiritual talkers. You're no different than the whisperers, than the mutterers. You're no different than those who are consulting the dead. No, you go to this word because it is a standard for us. It is one that is certain, it is, we can have confidence that what we're reading here is who God is and what He requires of us. What else must you do? When, you, when we go to the law, when, when we go to the testimony of God, you must conform to its precepts. 
Again, you're not just reading literature. And, and, don't, and you know that when you read the Bible, you're reading several forms of literature. But you're not just in engaging yourself in literary activity. You're reading God revealing himself to you and what he expects of man. So see that as the standard of what it is and conform to its precepts. Take and receive counsel from who? From God. Because you're reading it as such, you believe it as such. Do not give counsel and do not receive counsel outside of this standard. Let it, let this word, as the psalmist says, let it literally be like a lamp illuminating your path. Are you in the midst of a, of a serious decision? Are you, are you trying to sort out who you are and what you want to be? Then let the word of God illuminate this path. Are you, in the, are you in a pickle in a business dealing? Let the Word of God illuminate what you need to do. Are you, in the, are you in the throes of hardships at the workplace? Are your neighbors hurling insults against you? Let the Word of God illuminate your path. And do justly. A love of mercy. And walk humbly before your God. You ought to let this word examine your heart. You ought, to, you ought to let it be like a skilled surgeon. And there is a problem. Let a skilled surgeon of the word of God cut and expose and divide and, and show. The word of God even reveals itself as a sharper than a two-edged sword. Let it divide truth from untruth. Let it expose and let it show where the cancer of sin exists in your life. Let it examine your heart. You ought to be nourished by this word. When, when, when Isaiah says to the law and to the testimony, don't you know he's got the language of hunger and famished as he talks about those who are not walking under the light of God. Why not let the word of God nourish you? Jesus Himself says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of my Father. Is the Word of God nourishing you? You ought to be healed. You ought to, you ought to look to the Word of God to heal you. Is there a hardship in your life? When we let the light of Scripture in its illuminating position upon us, the danger is because we let the counsel of so many other people inside of us and we've not consulted our God on the matters, is that the counsel of many people will cause us to begin to doubt and see and even bring out problems that really aren't even in the Scripture text. And we begin to believe the opposed or apparent contradictions of them. No, let the Word of God nourish you and let it heal you. It is a, it is a healing balm upon a troubled soul. Do you believe it at all? That it is. Then don't go to the Scripture and walk away troubled. Go to it and let it heal you. Go to it as a, as a balm that soothes that which is troubled. Let this word of God, let this law, let this testimony define what holiness is. Stop letting Hollywood tell you what righteous is. Stop letting Motown tell you through their music. Stop letting Nashville influence you're thinking through their music. Go to the law and to the counsel of God immediately. Stop consulting those who are not influenced by the same standard. Turn off the preachers of the day who are not devoted to and, and submitted to the sufficiency of Scripture. Cut them out. They're, 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 they're leading a people famished. They're leading a people who are hungry. 
They're leading the people who are even at one level, if not already in position, cursing God in their religious activity while they embrace everything but God. Oh, dear church, ex exercise extreme caution here. Hear Isaiah when he says, to the law, to the testimony. I could remind you of what Isaiah said in, in chapter 5. Woe to you. You remember those six great warnings he gives to the church? Woe to you. You scribes. Or that's what Jesus says in Matthew 23. Woe to you who do this. Woe to you who pick up covetousness. Woe to you who pick up drunkenness. Woe to you who pick up self-righteousness. Woe to you who do not hear and do not attend to the word of God. Woe to you. There is, there is a right sense. There is a right way to see God and it has come through the influence that he gives through the right sense of his word. There is a difference between truth and falsehoods. The problem is, is that many don't know that. Many professing Christians don't know that. Why is that? They rarely let the word of God serve like a lamp to their feet. You know, young people, I, I, I get it. You're young and you have the whole world in front of you and you say, you just wish God would tell you what he wants from you. <laughs> Obviously, you're not reading his word. Because if you were, you'd have so much of God telling you what He wants from you, you wouldn't be able to do anything else. Oh, stop listening to the silliness of the age. The, the world wants to tell you how to pursue happiness, and you know it yourself that the pursuit of happiness always leads you to disappointment in what you currently have. Oh, it's not that God wants you to be content with unhappiness. It's that He wants you to put your happiness in Him. Will you? Or will you continue to consult the counselors of the age? These counselors of the age, they don't even understand themselves. You see from the text from Isaiah 21, 22, that these are even, they're even wandering souls. They're hard-pressed, they're famished, and they, 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 they turn away, they, they turn out of that, that which will satisfy them in spiritual hunger, and they'll turn to another table. They'll go to another refrigerator, spiritually speaking. They'll go to another source to nourish their souls, and, and at the end of the day, they are more hungry than they were previously. And the result of that is, is now, rather than see what they've done, they're in such a dark place that they blame the government and God for their hunger. They blame the government and God for their dissatisfaction. They blame the government and God for their unhappiness. They blame the government and God for everything in their lives. Not Why is that? Because they are in a dark place and they're being driven to an even darker place. Their thinking is not in place. And out of this, they begin now, their activity become, becomes a cursing activity. So in, in the final conclusion and an observation here is this. To use the term used by a, 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 a good biblical resource in our day, Todd Friel. An untethered spiritual being is among the most risky in society. Untethered by this, they are not willing to submit themselves to the instructions of God. They find them too binding, too restrictive, and not allowing them to, to really be themselves. It really is an untethered thinking. It, it feels like and it sounds like it's liberated, but really it's untethered altogether. And an untethered soul is one who wanders 
from place to place and they're hard pressed, they're hungry, they're famished. They're eager, but yet they're hungry. They're enraged and they're filled with anger against any proclamation of truth. They even spur it and stir it away from them and want nothing to do with it. They're unsettled in their whole of their being. They're driven from place to place. They're driven from thought to thought. They're driven from relationship to relationship. They're threatened like that of an, uh, of an invading army. As Ahaz is so concerned of this advancement of the kinsmen to the north, that they will turn to anybody and everybody to protect them from what appears to be a problem. So there is an invading army that is opposed to you. And as a result of this, there are those who will go out of the way. They will leave the law, they will leave the testimony of it and they will embrace the darkness. Those who go out of this way, not of the light, but rather they're going away from God and they go the way of all forms of evil. And they embrace it. And now they treat it as the new religion. They treat it as the new God. They treat it as, as this loving God that they thought they couldn't find in the truths of scripture why is that because they're unsettled they're untethered they're unbelieving they're unsatisfied they've become uneasy with themselves and so they're driven to satisfy this discomfort with the wrong counsel they begin to look for they, they know that where they're at is not good and so they they give ear to anyone who will speak to them and rather than seek the counsel of God, they allow the spiritist, they allow the philosophy, they allow that which is dark to come presenting itself as light to them. Can I conclude with a reminder of what Nehemiah has to say? In Nehemiah chapter 9, now just in the, time, in the time stamp of Scripture, Nehemiah's, you, we, we, would, we would look at, we would think Nehemiah must come sometime after Isaiah. Timeline-wise, it does. Uh, we shouldn't be bothered by the placement of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah where it is. Uh, if, you, if you're bothered by it, then just turn back a few other books and you'll see First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. So it actually makes sense that Ezra and Nehemiah are where they're at in the placement. They're not in the prophetic era range the, of the of the literature of scripture but nehemiah is writing and he's describing to us a people who have been driven by darkness they've been driven by and through captivity and nehemiah opens up for us he this isn't nehemiah speaking this is nehemiah recording to us what was spoken so if you've if you've gone to Nehemiah, follow along. If you're not there, just listen. And listen closely to this. As Renee and I were reading this this week in our evening reading, we were both struck by the, by the compassion of God. Listen again, or listen for the first time. Nehemiah chapter 9. I'll pick up the reading in verse 6 and following. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bows down before you. You are the Lord God. You chose Abram and you brought him up from Ur of the Chaldeans and you gave him the name Abraham you found his heart faithful before you and you made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanite of the Hittites and of the Amorites of the Perizzites and of the Jebusites and of the Gergeshite and, and to give it to this to his descendants and you have fulfilled you God you have fulfilled your promises for your righteousness 
you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and you heard their cry by the Red Sea. Then you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants and all of his people of the land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly toward them and you made a name for yourself as it is this day. You divided the sea before them so they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground and, they pursued, and their pursuers were hurled into the depths like a stone into raging waters. And with a pillar of cloud you led them by day and with a pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. Then you came down on Mount Sinai and you spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. So you made known to them your holy Sabbath and you laid down on them commandments, statutes and laws through your servant Moses. You provided bread for them, from heaven for them for their hunger. And you brought forth water from a rock for them for their thirst. And you told them to enter in order to possess the land which you swore to give them. But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. Even when they made for themselves a calf of molten metal and said, This is your God who brought you up from, the, from Egypt and committed great blasphemies. You, in your great compassion, did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. Your manna you did not withhold from their mouth, and you gave them water for their thirst. Indeed, 40 years you provided for them in the wilderness, and they were not in want. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet swell. You also gave them kingdoms and peoples, and allotted them to them as a boundary. And, you took, and, and they took possession of the land of Shion of the king of Heshbon, of the land of Og of the king of Bashan. And you made their sons numerous as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to enter and to possess. So their sons entered and possessed the land. And you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites. And you gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land to do with them as they desired. They captured fortified cities and a fertile land. They took possession of houses full of every good thing, hewn cisterns, vineyards, and olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and revealed, or reveled in your great goodness. But they became disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who, were admonished, who had admonished them so that they might return to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their oppressors who oppressed them. But when they cried to you in the time of their distress, you heard from heaven and according to your great compassion, you gave them deliverers and delivered them from the hand of their oppressors. But as soon as they had rest, they did evil again before you. Therefore, you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. 
But when they cried again to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you rescued them according to your compassion. And admonished them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments. But sinned against your ordinances. By which if a man observes them, he shall live. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and, stiff necked their, and stiffened their neck. And would not listen. However, you bore with them for many years. And you, you admonished them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of their lands, of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. For you are a gracious and a compassionate God. Isaiah, Nehemiah is recording for us of a people who've come home from a people who were in this day not seeking the counsel of God. Oh, may we be a people who will turn to God. May we love, may, may we do justly love mercy, and walk humbly before our God.